to embark on the 45th annual G. Arthur Q. Lectureship. 45 years. Happy Sabbath to you all. I think it's about Sabbath. Welcome. Welcome. This is uh, quite a journey of the Department of Religion and Theology here at Washington Adventist University. For 45 years, we have been conducting these lectures. At times, they have taken the form of a summit. This year, it has taken the form of something between the lecture and the summit. And I want to say a little bit about G. Arthur Q. G. Arthur Q served as a professor at the Department of Religion and also a chair. He was an educator, an administrator, an editor, and missionary who served the Seventh-day Adventist Church for 57 years on four continents. He founded Middle East College and later served as its, as its president. He was the author of four books, several adult Sabbath school quarterlies, and numerous articles. And he joined the religion department of then CUC, now Washington Adventist University, in, in, um, uh, in uh, 1965, where he taught the subjects Greek, Daniel, and Revelation, Hebrew prophets, and just about everything else, according to him. And he did that for many years. After retiring in 1974, he was named Professor Emeritus and CUC, then CUC, now WAU, asked him to return to teach classes and even, church, even serve as acting chair of the department. The annual G. Arthur Q. Lectureship is a monument to G. Arthur Q.'s commitment to scholarship, sound scholarship, and to the intellectual enterprise, not as something that will separate us from God, but as something to help us to understand ourselves and God better. So friends, again, welcome to the 45th annual G. Arthur Q. Lectureship. This weekend, we invite you into communion, into fellowship. The topic this weekend, who is a Seventh-day Adventist? Celebrating, note the word, celebrating the varieties of the Adventist experience. So we're not here to fight. We're here to celebrate, to fellowship, to understand each other, and to recognize our common faith, and to understand that the only thing on which we stand firmly is the amazing grace of God Amen. through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the call you've given us to be partakers and participants in this great plan of salvation. Thank you for the Seventh-day Adventist community. Thank you for the call you've given it to nurture faith and to help the world to come to know and understand you better. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will fall upon Washington Adventist University this weekend, fall upon this lectureship this weekend. May the participants be blessed, and may they bless. May we come, God, to know you and only you as a source of our hope, as a source of our strength. I pray you will bless all the presenters. Bless them with words from on high. And bless all the hearers. And I pray you will give them quickening minds and quick minds that they may be able to participate in this conference in a way that is uplifting to all of us. Thank you again. Let your Holy Spirit fall in the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, I want to introduce to you our provost, 
our dear anointed uh, provost, uh, provost Dr. Cheryl Kisunsu, and she will bring us greetings and opening remarks, as well as our chief of institutional effectiveness and technology, Mr. Ricardo Flores, who will bring us remarks on behalf of the president, who is off at a very important meeting of college presidents this weekend. So without further ado, our provost and then our chief, Ricardo Flores, will greet you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hemmings. I enjoy the definition of the word welcome, which means to receive with intentional delight. And so we re receive you with intentional delight. Dr. Hemmings, Professor Skur, they have been Yolanda, intentional, sometimes maybe not feeling delight, but intentional nonetheless, but delighted at what the Lord is doing through this series of lectures and what is anticipated for this weekend. Intentional Delight, our VP for Integrated Marketing and Communications and his team, you see all these cameras and these lights? These just don't happen automatically. Intentional Delight, because we have an experience, a story to share with the nations made possible through their gifts their abilities, and their commitment. Intentional delight from my heart to yours. Because in my quiet reflections, I was thinking that if Jesus were here, perhaps we would experience that which was, or I am hopeful will be, the rhythm of his instruction. I am mindful that when he made a declaration such as, you are the light of the world, that then he explained it, you know, and then he went on to talk about, oh, you know, a city that's on a, a lamp, you know, can't, shouldn't be hidden, or a city that's on a hill must, must be brilliant. Or when he said, you are the salt of the earth. It wasn't just a declarative that was made, but then it was further unwrapped. If salt loses its savor, then what good is it? And so this evening, this weekend, we unwrap the declarative of what it means to celebrate the dimensions of Adventist faith, such that we won't just have experienced a window in time, but so that we will rejoice more fully in our union with Christ, so that the roots of his love will go deeper in our souls, and so that ultimately, we will experience 2 Corinthians 3, 3 anointing. Our lives will be testimonies, written letters of recommendation to the world so that they too will experience this joy, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. And with that context and with intentional delight, I say welcome. Good evening, dear family. It is with rich anticipation and joy that I greet you today on behalf of our president, Dr. Wema Spence, and his administration to this important event. I am so pleased and delighted that you have decided to spend this precious moments of our Sabbath in this very important event, an event that happens once a year, the 2024 G author Keogh Lectureship. Whether you are new to the faith, whether you are second, third, or perhaps fourth generation SDA church member, or even if you're considering accepting Jesus Christ as your savior here today, it is important, and there I say essential, that we identify and know what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Over the years, the definition of SDA identity may have changed. Things shift during flight. What Adventism meant and how it may have been experienced and expressed by our grandparents 
may be different from what it means and how it may be expressed in our churches today. Adventism may very well be different from how it may be understood and expressed in the future. But one thing has not changed, and that is our deep-rooted belief in biblical doctrine and the spirit of prophecy. As we identify answers to our question over the weekend, who is a Seventh-day Adventist? And as we find ways to celebrate Adventism, I welcome each and every one of you to our campus, those who are physically here, those who are online, in hope that we'll enjoy our journey of exploring the many blessings that God has in store for each and every one of us throughout the weekend. May our time together be worship to God, our Lord and Savior. And from all of us to all of you, happy Sabbath and welcome to Washington Adventist University. At this time, we will welcome our speakers and presenters. And uh, as soon as I introduce you, uh, if please take a seat here, from here, there. Uh, our keynote speaker this weekend, Michael W. Campbell, uh, is a director or is the director of the North American Division Department of Archives, Statistics, and Research. He's an ordained minister who previously spent a decade in higher education in the Philippines and Texas. He's the coordinator of the Oxford Handbook of Seventh-day Adventism, due out on May 2024, and he's just finishing a textbook on Adventist history co-authored with Ed Allen to be released by Eerdmans later this year, Eerdmans' major publisher. He recently organized a conference on women in Adventist history as the first of a series of annual NAD research conferences. And forthcoming conferences will feature such topics as creation care, history of creeds, and anti-creedalism within Adventism. He has contributed numerous popular and peer-reviewed articles. Some of his research interests include a history and theology of the Lord's Supper, the typing movement, mission history, and themes connected to race and gender. He's the author of 12 books, including the most recent, We Stand on Their Shoulders, published by Pacific Press 2023, The Rise of Adventist Fundamentalism, Pacific, Pacific Press 2022. He's currently researching a book on the history of last generation theology. He contributes regularly to the Sabbath School Rescue and Adventist Pilgrimage podcasts. He enjoys bird watching, racquetball, pathfinders, He's married to Heidi, an early modernist, uh, uh, preparing to defend her PhD in history from Baylor University. And she hosts the podcast, They Also Served. They have two teenage children, Emma and David. Our respondents, Timothy Golden, is visiting professor. Thank you. <laughs> so take the first day. So Timothy Golden is visiting professor of philosophy at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. His areas of specialization are philosophical theology, 19th and 20th century European philosophy, and African American philosophy. His books include Frederick Douglass and the Philosophy of Religion and Interpretation of Narrative Art and the Political. And Racism and Resistance, Essays on Derrick Bell's racist, Racial Realism. Um, he earned his JD, Doctor of Jurisprudence, from the Thurgood Marshall School of Law, and his PhD in Philosophy from the University of Memphis. Dr. Golden was baptized into the Fellowship of the Seventh day Adventist Church on April 6, 1991, and since then he has been active in Sabbath School, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, and Men's Ministry. He's also an ordained elder, and from 2015 to 2023, he was professor of philosophy at Walla Walla University in College Place, or University in Washington. Golden's non-academic writing includes the Sabbath School Companion book for the fourth quarter of 2015, titled Jeremiah, Prophet of Crisis. He's originally from Philly, <laughs> Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Let's hear it from 
Joachim. Colette Neor is the Associate Director for Adventist Community Services at the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. In this role, she provides support and resources to the community development, urban ministries, and tutoring mentoring programs. She also works closely with ACS grant, Grants Initiatives. Prior to this, she was the Outreach Ministries Director in Western Washington, serving the Adventist Community Services and Prison Ministries programs, including the development and startup of a transitional house for men returning from prison, which she continues to serve on the board for. Colette's experience has included speaking at churches and conferences, teaching classes and seminars, and consulting one and on with groups. She's inspired by the people she works with and draws out the knowledge and passion of program leaders who, while building their capacity to serve, she continues it, or she considers it a joy to watch God call and empower his people to establish new and innovative ministries in their communities and a privilege to be a part of that process. Colette holds a Bachelor of Sociology from Whitman College and a Master of Administration from Andrews University and Certificate in, certificate in Fundraising Management from Indiana University. Colette and her husband Brad, and Brad is here with us today. Uh, Thurber have one grown son, Jacob. To re recharge her batteries, Colette will go kayaking, work in the flower beds at home, or seek out an experience with art. Miss Colette Neer. Mr. Brad Thurber, her spouse. And finally, we have Nicholas Miller, um, who has degrees in theology, his BA from PUC Law, Jewish student, uh, Doctor of Jurisprudence from Columbia University, and a church history from Notre Dame University. He's professor of law and religion at the Honors College at Washington Adventist University. He's also Senior Research Professor of Church History at the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Theological Seminary at Andrews University, where he has taught for nearly two decades. He's the author of numerous professional, professional and scholarly articles, and has written or edited five books, including The Religious Roots of the First Amendment, Oxford Press, 2012, as well as the forthcoming Handbook of Seventh-day Adventism, also by Oxford Press. All these, I am so pleased. <laughs> I feel so proud to know these uh, speakers and presenters and to perhaps call them friend. <laughs> uh, Michael, I know him as the nerd at ASRS who always sits in the front with his bow tie on. <laughs> and. Tim, the advocate, don't cross him. <laughs> and Colette, beautiful Colette that I met um, on Zoom. And of course, uh, the ever present in religious liberties and advocacy for social justice, Nicholas Miller. It's a delight to know you all. God bless you all. And we hand over now to, uh, oh, before we go, let us introduce the moderator of the panel, <laughs> Dr. Amilcar Grochel. Dr. Amilcar Grochel is adjunct professor at Washington Adventist University and also pastor at Potoma Conference. And um, Amilcar is uh, uh, also trained in jurisprudence and also trained in philosophy and ethics and uh, is uh, one of our upcoming growing scholars in Adventism. God bless you. Thank you for moderating for us. Here's your seat. Now I hand over to Amilcar. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here with you. And I know uh, to keep your words brief, especially when we're with a group of lawyers. So, yeah, there we go. And thank you to the administration, Dr. Hemmings, of course, Dr. Cheryl, and, and, and so on. It's a privilege to be here as we reflect uh, this week on, weekend on what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought just kind of a, a natural 
uh, beginning point would be some of the research that you've already done. Rather than just reinvent the wheel, you look at what you've been working on to explore these kinds of concepts. And uh, so I want to begin with the earliest beginnings of Seventh-day Adventism, which goes back to the Bible conferences from 1848 to 1851, and, and draw from that some, some of the essence of what is Seventh-day Adventism. And then, by the way, just a little preview, just to uh, let you know it's coming. Uh, tomorrow morning we have the Sabbath School of Faith and Reason. I always love, and, and so I know, talking to my wife, that uh, since we both love that Sabbath School class, that we kind of claim that, uh, uh, and, and so a lot of good friends there, is I, I know that if I didn't have something a little bit controversial, and so I, I went for something uh, tomorrow morning for Faith and Reason. Those of you, I see you smiling you're here, and so I, I want to do something on, on a, I'm calling it a brief history of Adventist anti-intellectualism, okay? So that, that's to just kind of get your juices going here for, for tomorrow. And then tomorrow afternoon is the second real part of this lecture series, uh, which I, I have uh, continuing on uh, on this trajectory of Bible conferences through the 20th century. And I hope to bring some of these concepts home on, on uh, even up to the present on within Seventh-day uh, Adventism. Now, a major consideration as we're thinking about these early Bible conferences from 1848 to 1851 has everything to do with progressive revelation and this spirit of activist roots that characterize the pioneers of this denomination. And while the denomination, of course, would not formally organize until 1863, um, I argue that the essential characteristics were well-defined uh, by this early time period through a series of organizing principles and shared beliefs that allowed these pioneers to, to rally around and celebrate this, this zeitgeist uh, that in turn became defining characteristics of this movement. But first, one must pause to discuss what were these Bible conferences and then examine these contextual considerations and the distill from these historical thoughts to define some lasting aspects of what does make Adventism unique. But first I turn to this idea of present truth and scripture. Now those of you that, that know me, I love Adventist history, this is my passion, and, and I kind of, this week I was looking, I, I actually wrote over a hundred articles in the new Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, it's become like in a compulsive addiction, you know, to keep writing, and so almost 400,000 words, I just, I added that up, and something like 6,000 footnotes, and and so, so this is kind of, I'm, I'm giving a bird's eye view this evening of some of my research, and if you really want the nitty gritty details, you can look at some of those encyclopedia articles, including the one on this Bible conference. But just in a nutshell here for you very briefly, there were 26 known pivotal Bible conferences that helped to define this early form formative stage of Adventism. And while many people know a few of these early Bible conferences, there are a few essential characteristics worth denoting. Number one, first is that they centered upon the primacy of Scripture. This would not be surprising considering the rich Protestant interpretive background, which was in no small measure influenced by Scottish common sense realism. Now, this pragmatic approach meant that the ordinary person could and should think for his or herself and allowed a certain pragmatic freedom to interpret the Bible in new and fresh ways. It was through scripture that individuals, notably William Miller, who was a deist and through the reading of scripture, uh, experienced a conversion. And I quote, suddenly the character of a savior was vividly impressed upon my mind. It seemed that there might be a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgression. I immediately felt how lovely such a being must be and imagined that I could cast myself into the arms of and trust in the mercy of such and one. In another place, he wrote how the scriptures, quote, became my delight and in Jesus I found a friend. It was this radical reading of scripture that allowed them to challenge misconceptions he had about God. This pattern would be repeated, ostensibly when Ellen Harmon uh, similarly had a comparable religious conversion experience. 
and the narrative of conversion, it should be noted, was this common refrain among the pioneers who shared similar epistemological foundations and through this common framework and language allowed them to see God in new and fresh ways. Now, a guiding principle to their approach to scripture was this notion of present truth. Now, this was a search for truth, at least as how they imagined it, as they attempted to create a bit of heaven on earth. Now, this would be an essential seeming almost contradiction, but in truth was a paradox in which Adventists would work for the kingdom of heaven and begin by laying siege through reforms here on earth. Early Adventists were activists. And whether one looks to the earliest Millerites right on through the earliest Sabbatarian Adventist believers, they believed in a whole host of reforms, from health reform to prison and educational reform and so on. And while this world would burn, and until it did, one must wage war on behalf of the kingdom of heaven. Now, early Adventists were ardent abolitionists, and even some recent research by a friend of mine, Kevin Burden, who just completed his dissertation on this topic, suggests that these foundations were far more extensive among the Millerites than previously recognized. I argue that it is the same essential ethos that was part of, uh, uh, of this early Sabbatarian Adventist identity. Now, a case in point is that one of the notable outgrowths of these 1848 to 1851 Bible conferences was the development of a periodical and the press. Now, at first, they didn't seem to even have enough money to print their own periodical, for which the prophetic gift would challenge these believers to venture out in faith. Now, there was this famous streams of light vision that took place in 1848, incidentally, at one of these early Bible conferences. And when James White finally mustered up enough courage to step out in faith, what press did he go to to have his periodical published? Well, it was the press of James Pelton. Now, if you examine, why was it the press of James Pelton? There were six or seven other printers in the nearby town. So why was it the press of James Pelton? Then I started doing some research. And this is the fun part of being a historian. You go back and do research and you find the things that other people have missed. And, and you start looking at the other imprints and you discover that this was an abolitionist printer. And this is really important because we need to understand that our Adventist identity, even the very fact that this idea of print was forged on the presses of activism and abolitionism. The cause did not stop and, uh, and would continue during this formative time period uh, to follow believers. And, and Ellen White would even challenge, not only as they had a press, but challenge them, challenging these early believers in the, in the wake of the Fugitive Slave uh, Act to disobey, and one must follow the laws of God above the laws of man. So there's this essential characteristic of the primacy of Scripture, which led early pioneers on a radical new path to search for truth, and that created a core framework centered around the Bible, the book, the book of all books, as the inspired word of God. And it would make Adventism as a people, as those who defined themselves as a people of the book, and created this liminal space within which, as defined by scripture and as opposed to human creeds, that Adventists would search for both new truths and fight against the injustices in the world in which they lived. Now, I want to reflect for just a minute on this idea, not only of progressive truth, but also a notion of what they called, the terminology they themselves used, called the, the scattered flock. This is an essential characteristic or component that defined early Sabbatarian Adventism was not only this fierce independence about what they believed was right no matter what. Now, early believers championed the causes they believed in despite even radical persecution. Well, this is an aspect that's not always talked about. It does showcase how Adventism was radically countercultural. Now, whether this was uh, essential uh, a belief in the second advent that caused mobs to tar and to feather early believers, as in the case of Hiram Edson, who had a mob 
surround his house and would uh, literally did a tug of war as they tried to drag early believers out. And at one point, there was somebody that had taken a frying pan, hit one of those Millerites. There was blood. There was mayhem. It was crazy. And in the middle of all of that, Hiram Edson jumps into the fray and uh, of that bloody brawl and tells them, you can tear me to a thousand pieces, but you cannot get me to give up my faith in Jesus and his soon return. And according to his daughter, he spoke with such fierce conviction that uh, immediately the, the, the mob dispersed and left them alone. Now, these were not only vivid memories for a, 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 of a young child of the great disappointment, but such persecution would not go away afterwards. You see, these newfound convictions about the Seventh-day Sabbath and abolition were equally unpopular in the culture of the time. Hence, the most common self-descriptor by James and Ellen White and other believers was to refer to themselves as the scattered flock. They were a persecuted lot who saw themselves as standing for the cause of right, and if scripture was on their side, they were content. Now, that's not to say that there weren't many who did give up their faith, and uh, for those, but, but for those who chose to remain, it only strengthened their resolve. Perhaps another way of looking into this core identity of these early believers is to study the way they worshipped. In various places, I have explored and written on this, this topic of how early Sabbatarian Adventist worship was dynamic and, at times, somewhat enthusiastic. The, the term charismatic sometimes comes into play, although that's a little bit anachronistic. It was not uncommon for there to be varying periods of times of testimony, scripture reading, hymns, prayer, and when they were fortunate enough to have a preacher, they would let that person preach their heart out from morning to night. At some times, the ecstasy of the occasions, they would even last all night long. Of course, men stayed in the barn, women had the luxury of the farmhouse, but as they expressed themselves through their worship, they would, uh, in ways, and by the way, this would sometimes probably make most of us in this room rather uncomfortable. But it was not unusual at times even for there to be speaking in tongues and miraculous healings. Early Adventist worship was far more integrated than ever realized. And only recent years have historians begun to realize uh, who some of these early believers were, indicating, uh, again, this much more integrated composition of these congregations. E Ari L. Barr, for example, was a well-known black preacher who traveled on circuits throughout New England preaching the, Sab the Sabbath message. And even more recently, and I'm talking in the last few weeks, uh, historians have been able to uncover some of the uh, registers of the congregation in Washington, New Hampshire, one of the most famous churches in Adventism to discover that it was an integrated congregation of black, white, and Native American, or, uh, and so on. This message of Christ's soon return meant not only fighting against slavery, but truly living in an integrated community. Another aspect of this early Sabbatarian Adventist worship was the presence and leadership of women. Once again, during a liminal space in American culture on the heels of the Second Great Awakening as both male and female were one in Christ and united together in the promulgation of their beliefs to others. Now, one last aspect of early Adventist worship, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, were the songs they sung themselves. Once again, it is difficult to truly appreciate um, the study of Adventist hymnody, um, it's a truly a glaring lacuna in Adventist studies. It's unbelievable that more people have not really worked in this area. And yet we can quickly glean just how important themes such as the second advent of Christ, and, and I give a whole bunch of examples in my, in my paper. I'm not going to go on and, and emphasize it, it and give examples of these, but, but if we would go back and study the hymnody, I think there would be uh, some significant um, areas that we could see um, both intellectual and, and, and various aspects of growth within the ethos of the various things that I'm talking about. Much more work definitely needs to be done in this area. Now I want to talk about some other contextual considerations. It's worth taking the time to pause to acknowledge some of these historical uh, considerations already mentioned above, but this contributed, um, and I want to explore this general ethos that, that contributes to the, the backdrop 
uh, out of which Adventism arose. And I would argue one of the most significant um, is the Christian connection. Now, if you've never heard of the Christian connection before, it was this radical group of restorationists who sought the primitive purity of the early Christian church, or at least as best as they could tell. Now, while Adventist historians have widely acknowledged the contributions of Ellen White and thereby Methodism, others, William Miller and the Baptists, but perhaps the greatest legacy comes from the Christian connection. A loosely defined restorationist group uh, led by Elias Smith and Abner Jones in the uh, New England part of the United States. Now, some people are probably more familiar with uh, Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell in the American South. Um, and by the way, this is not just Adventist studies that there's lacunas, but there's a major lacuna in American religious history uh, that, that no one's really written any uh, extensive um, work on the Christian connection. But it is significant to note that in, in Adventism, James White and Joseph Bates, two of our three major co-founders of our church, were part of the Christian connection. Now, the connection preached, as I'm going to call it, the connection, this gospel of, or, or gospel liberty, which meant that all believers must base their faith on the teachings of the Bible and that their understanding would only continue to grow. The most distinctive feature of this restorationism was its own blended synthesis of Arminian theology, now emphasizing free will, with adult baptism and congregational polity. They were fiercely anti-organizational. The, the, the polity was really based at the local uh, church. They also emphasized the need to reason from the Bible and the Bible alone, rejecting any human devised creeds or man-made impositions upon scripture. They also espoused, intriguingly, a pacifist outlook and rejected military service. And this democratic appeal quickly took root within American Christianity, especially as it harnessed the power of print. Numerous religious periodicals resulted as well as health manuals and hymnals. The Christian connection was fiercely egalitarian, egalitarian welcoming freed slaves and, once again, empowering women to preach. And while there is some ambiguity, it seems quite likely that the Adventist understanding of conditionalism, or this idea of soul sleep, arose out of Christian connection circles. And it was this Christian connection search for <clears throat> present truth that would become a watchword, and um, early Sabbatarian Adventists would quickly embrace and name their own first periodical uh, after this same idea that we've already talked about. Now, I want to return to these Bible conferences, right? From uh, Let's talk about these Bible conferences again. Now that we've talked about some of these contextual considerations, I want to um, revisit these, these early Bible conferences from the 1840s. Now, I've published on in more detail on these historiographical nuances, but suffice it to say that these Bible conferences have often been referred to but little studied. So my goal this past year has been to try to move past some of the layers back to the primary sources to uncover perhaps more of a fresh look at the 1848 Bible conferences. Now I'll give you very quickly um, some examples. There, I'm not going to use names because I'm not here to embarrass anyone, but one of, uh, one of our leading liberal scholars in the church made a, uh, a quotation that was a really great quotation. And when I went back to look it up, guess what? It wasn't there. And then historian after historian after historian, they never go back and check the primary source. They always cited the secondary source. And so this kind of myth, shall we say, was perpetuated. And West, West, unless you think it was just the more liberal, progressive side of Adventism, one of our most conservative scholars in the denomination works in a building not too far north of here. Uh, and, and I saw an article that they wrote in an illustrious magazine that I see a former editor of here wrote a great article, and I love the quotation. And then I went back to look it up, and guess what? It's not there. And then there's a whole slew of conservative scholars that quote that particular historian as well. So, so we have to be very careful and intentional to go back. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying I'm infallible. I do not believe in inerrancy, so I'm not going to cast the first stone here, historiographical stone. But, but as a historian, I would say that we are, it behooves us to go back and check the primary original sources for ourselves. Anyway, so that's what I've been trying to do. Go back to the original sources. And uh, as, as 
Most people talk about, and, and most Adventist historians agree that the first of these Bible conferences happened April uh, 20th uh, to 24, 1848, with about 50 people in attendance at the farm of Albert Belden. Um, uh, but, but this would mark a significant turning point, but I would argue a turning point for what? In brief, most Adventist historians have characterized this time as one in which Adventist beliefs were formed. Yet it seems quite clear that this was not the case. And all of the core pillar doctrines, the Sabbath, Sanctuary, Stay of the Dead, Second Coming, and the Spirit of Prophecy were already clearly defined and enunciated well before this point. Still yet others have argued that this is when the doctrines of the Sabbath and sanctuary were combined. But, uh, and, and this is the view, for example, of Mervyn Maxwell, who named these conferences the so-called Sabbath and sanctuary conferences. And yet, once again, these doctrines were well in place before these conferences actually took place, although this may belie other interests within Adventism in the early 1980s, uh, mainly pertaining to a certain person by the name of Desmond Ford and what is known as Glacier View. So oftentimes, history tells us more about ourselves than it does about, uh, and the way we tell history, than it does about, um, uh, or perhaps even an apologetic way of doing history, right? So you, you get the point where I'm trying to go, let's go back a little bit more um, if we can, um, and that's why I'm trying to emphasize the essential characteristics uh, being this primacy of scripture and a democratic and common sense approach that allowed them to both see God and the Bible prophecy in a way that made sense to them in their world. But rather than these conferences being solely about defining Adventist beliefs, which I don't argue, which, um, uh, which I argue is really, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's claiming too much, I instead argue that these conferences were far more pervasive and activist in nature as they coalesced together. These early Sabbatarian Adventists were really looking for ways to share their faith in the wake of the disappointment as the enormity of sharing their faith to a world around them increasingly dawned upon them. Now this can also be seen as the primary contribution of these conferences being the spread of print. Not only do they conceptualize things by this point, but then how do they share them, right? And this is where they begin to become innovative in developing not only a new periodical, actually two periodicals, but they also develop a prophecy chart. Now, this may not be very important unless you're an Adventist historian, these little nuances, but everyone's dated that as 1850, and they call it the 1850 prophecy chart, but now I argue it's the 1851 prophecy chart, because if you go back to the original sources, it wasn't until 1851 that the chart came into being. Anyways, I, 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 this is getting lost in the weeds here, but I want it to be noted that this is an important part of this ethos that is developing within Adventism during this time is how do they um, challenge themselves to share the, their faith in an activist way that, that allows them to share their values. By the way, um, as funds were raised, not only did they, uh, were they able to do this chart, but then it becomes a series of meetings out of which they begin to make um, a number of other uh, resolutions. Now, uh, it's interesting, I started charting out where all of these different conferences, and I found some additional conferences that some people had missed before. Notably, uh, most significantly for me, since I'm Canadian, is they missed one in Canada. Uh, and so that extends that range just a little bit more. You know, I think that's kind of important that Canada not get forgotten. Um, but but um, all of these conferences were, there were conferences held multiple times at each of these different places um, as these periodicals became a place and center for them to distribute publications and uh, various other ideas. Now, I want to talk briefly about the, the gift of, of prophecy here. Uh, and the role of Ellen White in the formation of our church during this uh, significant time. And this is a recurring theme throughout Adventist history and a theme I'll re uh, return to uh, throughout this lectureship, especially tomorrow afternoon, is the relationship of uh, the church to Ellen White and the relationship of Ellen White's prophetic ministry and her writings uh, to the church and to the Bible. It's notable that Ellen White, on various occasions during these early Bible conferences, noted how her mind was locked and she was unable to participate in um, any of the deliberations. 
Now, while many of the core beliefs were defined among the, this, this group of believers, she also described how some of these early gatherings uh, were characterized by more, um, uh, how, how few that were gathered together actually agreed on any one uh, thing. Some turned to Ellen White, hoping for easy answers. That's the joy of having a prophet, right? Please, just tell us, you know. Um, if she could only just have a vision. In a series of occasions, and while some dispute the supernatural aspects of her holding a Bible outstretched and for how long, what is significant is that she pointed people to the primacy of the Bible through her prophetic ministry. And now, while one can contrast Ellen White with other 19th century prophetic figures who attempted to find the Bible through their writings, she, by way of contrast, would always consistently describe her writings as a lesser light to lead men and women back to the greater light, that is to say the Bible or ultimately Jesus. Now that's not to say that during her lifetime or since her writings haven't been misused and abused and that some people have used her writings as a way for interpreting the Bible. But at least when she was alive, she was nothing short of emphatic in seeing her prophetic ministry not as one that defined scripture, but once again pointed people to the authority and primacy of scripture. So why have a prophet at all? Her prophetic ministry seemed to be focused more on lifestyle and making sure that these early believers got along. And while she certainly made profound theological statements that lead us closer to Christ, it is imperative to note that her in her own self-understanding, the Bible was always paramount. Now, she would, and the church would spend the rest of her lifetime wrestling with and trying to define these contours, a challenge that would come up again after her death at the 1919 Bible Conference. We'll talk about that tomorrow, uh, where they would again, uh, but we'll leave that for just for tomorrow. Back to the 1840s. Early Sabbatarian Adventists were furthermore very sensitive of the accusation that they could be confused with Joseph Smith and Mormonism. And as a consequence, James White refused to for several years publish his wife's visions, a move that the church would ultimately find problematic and lead to a changing of the edit editorship of the review and a policy change allowing Ellen White's writings to be widely circulated. It would also be a flexible hermeneutic that allowed Ellen White to have her own writings translated into other languages. By the way, that's one of Ellen White's, if you compare Ellen White with other 19th century uh, religious figures, she stands out in stark contrast. Now I wanna talk about legacy, the legacy of these prof uh, prophetic conferences so I stay on target here with time. The early Sabbatarian Adventists were ardent abolitionists or activists whose epistemological foundations and methods allowed them to view God from an entirely new and refreshing way. The Bible was, as they said, their creed. Such views did not occur in a vacuum as many of these early pioneers brought with them their restorationist approaches that prioritized a democratic, common sense approach to the Bible. As they sought to restore the church to its primitive purity, they fought against the evils in their world, seeking to institute a more egalitarian peace of heaven on earth and working for the kingdom of God. One of the things I wanna emphasize tonight, and I'm just very quickly, uh, uh, pause for just a moment but this is one of those things that causes us to pause here for today how can we think in ways that allow us as a church what does it mean to be a seventh-day adventist what does it mean to think in egalitarian ways and ways that help to challenge and challenge and counter cultural ways informed by scripture and our adventist values the kingdom of god here on this earth perhaps the best showcase of this change was the 1848 to 1851 Bible conferences that show this radical way of not only reading the Bible, but living out their worship, in which in turn became a network through which they disseminated their views more widely. The movement harnessed the power of print and creative new media like the 1851 prophetic chart. Now these early believers were forged around a common identity of present truth that led to a general suspicion of hierarchy and creeds and led them to in creative new paths even if it meant persecution for either theological or social stances that they stood for. Adventists were activists and fought for what they believed in. And I pause again. The best of Adventism continues to be 
activist that will challenge both theological or social stances based upon scripture. And finally, this is the first installment in the series for this, this weekend, highlights the importance of Bible conferences for Adventist identity. Now, as we shall see throughout this weekend, Adventism would continue to wrestle with interpretive issues, not least of which was Ellen White's prophetic ministry and her relationship to the Bible, but at least during this formative time period, Ellen White consistently played a passive role when it came to the formation of theological beliefs and concentrated her efforts upon social challenges such as the relationship um, and various aspects of Adventist lifestyle and polity, basically how we get along together within our Adventist tribes. Adventism would need help, and at least from its earliest beginnings, there was a clear pattern that was established that her writings were intended to point people back to Scripture, not to replace it. And as we seek this weekend to reflect upon our Adventist identity, we would do well to remember these early Bible conferences, these early biblical foundations, and this legacy of activism that made our early Adventist forebears poised to engage their worlds. In similar ways, as we think about who is an Adventist this weekend, it gives us an opportunity to look at how Adventism has and continues to deal with change. Topics again for tomorrow. But until then, we are confronted with an Adventism that was far more diverse. Now, we would do well to linger on this notion of present truth. Who is a Seventh-day Adventist? At least during this early formative stage, it was a group of people who passionately loved Jesus, that he was coming again and allowed these foundations to change their lives and challenge the world around them. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Such a joy to be here. And the joy that I experienced when Dr. Hemmings extended the invitation to be a respondent this weekend is only exceeded by the joy at reading the question at the top of the page for Dr. Campbell's remarks tonight. What does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I want to begin my, my remarks by lauding Dr. Campbell for this effort. The preparation of these lectures and delving into the history of Adventism as you have has enriched me as a respondent, and I hope that my remarks can only further that enrichment as we go forward. What is so commendable, Dr. Campbell, about what you have done is you have tied together the question of identity with the realities of history. And if there is one discipline that can claim, I'm not sure what the problem is with the microphone, if there is one discipline, maybe I'll step back a little bit, uh, if there's one discipline that can claim a close connection to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is history. Because the very notion of Jesus as the incarnate word of God is premised upon the idea that the eternal became historical in order to save us. And there are lots of object lessons in nature, but I'll just make one observation before we get going here tonight. In Genesis 1.14, the Bible says that God made the stars also on the fourth day when he hung lights in the heavens. And what fascinates me so much about this text is that the sun is a star. Now, when you take a walk on a sunny day, 
I hope tomorrow is bright and sunny. I'm not sure what the forecast is, but I hope it's going to be sunny tomorrow. So as you find yourself walking to and fro tomorrow, understand that the warmth of the sun that you feel on your body is literally an engagement with history. Because the sun as you feel it on your body is not the sun as it is in that moment. It is the sun as it was eight minutes prior. Because it takes light traveling to Earth from the sun at the breakneck speed of 186,000 miles per second eight minutes to travel 93 million miles. And based on my own experience with Jesus, I would submit that perhaps one of the reasons God hung the sun in the sky was as a mercy to remind us of the history in which we are all saturated, a history in which we entered, in which he entered, in order to save us, and a history that is blotted out, our history, by his most righteous shed blood. So I'm grateful to Dr. Campbell for his engagement with history, and I'm grateful that we are framing this lectureship this weekend in terms of a connection between identity and history, because if you don't know who you are, it becomes very easy for others to come along and tell you who they want you to be. And so, that said, we begin with this question of what does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist? I have four observations, and none of them are intended as criticisms of the wonderful work Dr. Campbell has done. None of them are intended to be dogmatic proclamations about what's most important. They are spoken tonight and throughout this weekend when I respond in a spirit of celebration. Because celebrating oneself means engaging all parts of who we are. First and foremost, to be a Seventh-day Adventist means that an honest mysticism about God is preferable to a dishonest dogmatism about God. When I began reading Dr. Campbell's lecture, I was struck by the phrase epistemological foundations, and I think it is terribly important, as Dr. Campbell has done, to explore the origins of our beliefs, because that's what epistemology is. I'm a philosopher, so I have, I have two problems. I have a steroid problem. My first steroid problem is that I went from being a lawyer to being a philosopher. And philosophers are lawyers on steroids. Dr. Miller will tell you lawyers argue about things that at least matter to people. <laughs> Did he do it? Is he guilty? Philosophers argue about things like, are we really in this room <laughs> right now? Not only do I have that steroid problem, the other steroid problem I have is that I'm not only a Christian and a Protestant, I'm an Adventist. And Adventists are Protestants on steroids because we protest the Protestants, right? So this business of locating the origins of our beliefs is good, but it becomes problematic if we engage ourselves in a quest to show that our beliefs themselves have rigorous and philosophically significant foundation. Because philosophy and Christian theology are in some sense fundamentally distinct from one another. The logos is the end game of the philosopher. But the scriptures tell us that the logos is merely in the beginning 
that the end of Christian theology is not the word of John 1, 1. That's in the beginning. But the end of Christian philosophy is the sarks or the flesh of John 1, 14. You see how John 1, 1 is almost an engagement with an abstract word, but John 1, 14 is a radical engagement with historical embodied flesh. Because if the word was never made flesh, if God never entered into history to save us, then we would be in a very bad way. So I would rather us be honest about what we don't know than be dishonest about what we claim to know because the more dishonest we are about what we claim to know, you know what we end up doing? We end up importing all of the problematic philosophical ideas into Christian theology. And we spend so much time trying to justify our beliefs that we spend far too little time loving God and loving the neighbor. So to be a Seventh-day Adventist is to be engaged in a, a level of honest mysticism about what we don't know rather than an inauthentic, dishonest quest for dogmatism about things that God has wisely kept from us. Secondly, to be a Seventh-day Adventist means to be engaged in a relentless search or a relentless quest to retrieve the spirit of Hiram Etsy. Because somehow the Advent founders had a fervor and such a deep commitment to natural law as, as Dr. Campbell pointed out, Ellen White said in the time of the fugitive slave law that we ought to obey God rather than men. So in 1857, the Supreme Court decides Dred Scott, and in the wake of the Dred Scott decision, there were fugitive slave laws such that if you were a slave and you escaped captivity, if you were captured, you had to be sent back, right? Now, what Ellen White develops is this robust idea that we ought to obey God rather than man. That's natural law theory at its finest. But then what happened? It seemed like the spirit of the Advent founders against abolition died with abolition. Because the same Ellen White that told us to obey God rather than men was the same one who told us in the post-Reconstruction South, and this is not a crit, I'm not criticizing Ellen White, and I'm certainly not criticizing you, Dr. Campbell, but the same Ellen White who told us that we had to obey God rather than men under the fugitive slave laws was the same one who told us that it wasn't safe for blacks and whites to worship together in the post-Reconstruction South. And so somehow the spirit that stood so strongly against chattel slavery subsided in the wake of black codes and Jim Crow. And since then, to be a Seventh-day Adventist means to be engaged in a quest to retrieve that radical spirit that even today, and goodness knows there's plenty of reasons today to have that spirit. Just as it was had during the early days of Adventism, but, but something happened with abolition and it faded away. To be a Seventh-day Adventist is to be one who pays attention to detail. There were lots of talk about men and women working together in Dr. Campbell's remarks. And again, this is not a criticism of Dr. Campbell, but to be a Seventh-day Adventist means to understand how the terms men and women as we use them today and read them back into historical circumstances are abstractions that are themselves insensitive to history. 
To be a Seventh-day Adventist means to understand that the temperance movement was actively used as a vehicle for anti-black misandry that enabled Francis Willard, who headed the Women's Christian Temperance Union, to say that although she supported abolition, black men and black people should not get the right to vote precisely because they were uneducated, ignorant, black sambos, that all they did was go to the dance hall and consume liquor. I'm not suggesting that Ellen White participated in this. this again, these aren't criticisms. But if we're going to celebrate ourselves, we have to figure out how we can get back to a spirit of detailed attention to history. And lastly, I'll just say this, to be a Seventh-day Adventist means to be honest about what we're doing. We can't say we don't want any man-made doctrine, we're only going to look at the scripture without realizing that that is a man-made doctrine and that the hermeneutic circle is vicious, that when we engage in interpretation from the very beginning, the interpretive enterprise is always already foregrounded with the interests of the one doing the interpreting. Thank you so much. I look forward to more conversation. Good evening, I tell you. When they asked me to come, I did not. I was, no, I was going after you. So <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard, we're going to let the weight of the Tuckies <laughs> comment calm down a little bit, but, but it is such a pleasure to, to serve on this panel with so many good people. Our theme of what is an Adventist, and Dr. Campbell chose an interesting and enlightening place to begin, which is right at the inception. Um, so I thank you for taking us back, not just in time, but to the people who made up the roots of this movement and highlighting those key threads that were so integral to weaving us together into a movement. The, the values and the actions that you describe were the bricks laying that foundation of the Adventist church. And seeing these gives insight into what we are currently today. So it's that thread from there. If you don't know where you began, you can't trace it to where you are today. Um, and I look forward to continuing to follow these threads throughout this weekend and to see where that will take us and what insights we can gain about ourselves now. Uh, my work in Adventist community services embeds me among people who fold themselves into the community, righting wrongs. They are the practitioners of our church. So my ears perk up at the counterculture activism we find right at the beginning. I am encouraged to find this influence and the emphasis on being fiercely egalitarian. What a beautiful word at the very beginning of our movement. So it is embedded in our identity, but I'm also a little confused about what our experience is today among our service missions workers, and I have never seen one come even close to being charred and feathered. Um, and it makes me, gives me some pause about what we are doing, how we are doing it, and if we are delving deep enough. Um, I, I love that you, en you enlightened us to the fact that there were congregations where black, whites, and Native Americans worshiped together, um, where women were accepted as leaders without fanfare, and that black preachers served white communities. And Dr. Golden, you show us how quickly things changed how quickly we lose that. So the question that I have in response that came to my mind in response to this presentation is what happened to that influence of the Christian connection and all of those reformers? Where did that, where did the shift happen and how did that happen? Because if we can identify how things happen, then we can either correct or find our way back or keep, a, keep ourselves from continuing to drift. 
I find that influence of activism reflected in the legacy of our church's involvement with social good through the Dorcas Society very early on through Advent Community Services, through ADRA and many, many, many other ministries. Um, however, a study has also shown that Adventist member involvement in caring about communities today is typically through financial giving. And is there something to be rediscovered? Tonight's presentation notes that there was a desire to share beliefs with others using abolitionist presses to print prophetic messages. And that suggests that social change was intertwined with our sharing of faith. And I believe that there is still value in this combination, in this marrying of both faith and works. And sociologist Rodney Stark identifies sacrificial living as a root of the explosive growth of the Christian movement in Rome in the early church. So while plagues were sweeping across through Rome, the wealthy and the powerful left the city, but Christians stayed behind to nurse the sick. And this led to some Christians losing their lives, yet the care given also saved many people and their experience of having Christians caring for them drew many, many more to the faith and just caused an explosion of growth. So fast fashioning deeds and faith together. And does our church today reflect a continuation of this drive and belief? And I would be interested in a deeper dive into this question. I have not read all 500 of your articles. Um, but just tracing that thread of activism from then to now, and I believe it would be very revealing about our church as well as about ourselves, and it is worth continued study. Um, so our church today, is it more or less egalitarian than it was in 1848? Their choices as Christian connection and others made required sacrifice. So even if we love each other personally, are we willing to sacrifice enough of our own cultural preferences to create a collective culture where everybody feels welcome? And that brings me to another theme that I think this, this talk brought to light, and that is the concept of present truth. The term present truth not only implies that we have made new discoveries to, for today, but there, there will be further discoveries for tomorrow. We see through a glass darkly, so our faith continues to evolve. And this begs the question of what sort of posture do we need to take to be able to be ready for the next iteration of truth in our lives? Are we receptive towards learning in an effort to live our beliefs in a culture that may not agree with us? Is there a tendency to hold these faiths so tightly that we miss out on tomorrow's truth? and to gain understanding of essential pieces of our faith. So I, there, there was a lot that came to mind, and I appreciate this, this many questions, but I will, I will close it out for there. Um, I, 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 one last note, Ellen White, she was not given a word, and that leaves us to grapple with our faith. We, we tend as humans to desire concrete answers and decisive formulas to follow. If I do this, I get this. I will be saved. They will be right. But not having those answers forced us back to the primacy of scripture and to continue to search and plumb the depths of an infinite God. So the legacy left by this history is one where each of us has that responsibility to turn back to the scriptures for ourselves and discover what God is saying. Well, I'm not sure what there's left to be said. We've heard from the historian and the philosopher and the practitioner, but I am a lawyer and they always think of things to say, so I think we're safe. Um, you know, that was just tremendous uh, from all of you. I think that uh, Director Neuer entering with the notion of present truth answers a lot of our questions, and, and I'm gonna touch on that a little bit. Um, listening to, whenever I hear a presentation from Dr. Golden, I feel that I've been through a seminar and learned new things. Um, and especially his first and fourth points are, are, are things I'm going to explore for a couple of minutes here. I am going to suggest perhaps, 
I feel there is a falling away as a historian as well. I would date it slightly further perhaps than Dr. Golden would. I think that Ellen White was an idealist, but I think she was also a realist and a pragmatist. And I think what she would advise fairly uh, well-insulated elite white Northern Adventists to do in opposition to the Fugitive Slave Act was somewhat different from what she felt she could tell Southern um, interlopers and black Southerners to do, and that in fact uh, interracial worship would have ended with the deaths of some whites and many more blacks, and that what she said and did was in fact in furtherance of black welfare. Now you might remember she said, until the Lord shows us a better way, and I believe she would have been willing to move forward at the slightest opportunity of doing these things in safety, but our church did change, and we became regressive in relation to race in the 1920s and 30s, and we did not follow the pathway that her idealism would point a, her, a, us towards. Um, and I, I would fully acknowledge that. Um, to begin with Michael's fine presentation, though, the, the two themes that struck me as I looked uh, through his paper and listened to it here are these biblical foundations and commitment that are allied to a biblical, prophetic, social engagement commitment. And the reason that's so interesting is because it's quite often the opposite today. Today, it seems to be the theologically liberal sides of the church that are more willing to engage in social justice and social reform, and the theologically conservative side of the church that is more spiritually and heavenly minded and quicker to push back against social justice and critical race theory and anything too woke, right? I think we recognize this in the culture that we live in. And the question is, why is that the case? Um, and I think part of it is a reframing of present truth, as, as has already been suggested. For our pioneers, present truth was prophetic truths from the Bible applied to the problems and challenges of today, of their day, and we have taken present truth to be prophetic truths applied to the challenges of their day, not our day. So for many people, present truth is 1844, or it's 1888, or it's the 1950s talking about questions on doctrine. Much less is it what would Adventist prophetic outlook say to today's issues of racism, uh, sexism, capitalism, exploitive capitalism in America. Our pioneers had much more to say about all of those things. Now why was early Adventism different in this understanding of present truth. And part of it, I think, has to do with our approach to the Bible. Uh, Dr. Campbell's made out a good case that we took the Bible seriously. We made it the center of our biblical teaching. But I think there needs to be a, a recognition that in the early church, today we talk about biblical conservatives and biblical liberals in the Adventist church. In the early church, we really didn't have a liberal progressive wing we had two versions of conservatives. We had moderate conservatives and we had fundamentalists. And actually in Adventism, moderate conservatism was more pervasive. There was a larger Protestant fundamentalist wing that surrounded us and that we were influenced by to some degree, but also with which, against which we pressed back. You may be familiar with some phrases like verbal inerrancy verbal dictation inspiration. We did not believe those things. Fundamentalists tended to. Ellen White specifically and even our own church leaders generally rejected it. I'm sure you can find some who embraced it and so there was a dialogue between these two groups. But the issue was of significance because a fundamentalist approach to the Bible, encouraging where you believe every word is dictated by God, tends to encourage a surface reading of scripture, where you take the words as you find them and you apply them directly without much more further interpretation. A con moderate conservative approach to the Bible takes a more principled approach to biblical interpretation and says, what is the larger meaning, the larger context, and in short, 
When the Bible says slaves obey your masters, the fundamentalist says, see, slavery was acceptable in the Bible. There's no biblical case against it. The moderate conservative says, wait, we have to look at the time, place, and circumstances of what slavery meant in the Hebrew world, in the Greco-Roman world, and we discover that it wasn't a race-based slavery. It wasn't a race-based chattel slavery. It was an economic condition, an institution that did have its brutalities, but was not identical with or even really close to an American racial slavery that says just because you have a certain colored skin, you are automatically a slave forever. And that's what allowed our pioneers, who were biblically moderately conservative, to oppose slavery, to be in favor of women leading out in church services, to be actively engaged in public issues of temperance reform and voting, whereas fundamentalist Protestants generally supported slavery or said nothing against it, were opposed to any form of women's leadership, and often either supported or opposed political involvement on issues of alcohol. So I want to suggest, and tomorrow Michael's going to talk about the biblical conferences in the 20th century, and I want to suggest there's a framework, not just of conservative and liberal, but of fundamentalist conservative and liberal, that will bear paying attention to in our next lectures, and we'll have more discussion tomorrow afternoon, and I'll leave you with a question. If we more fully understood this difference between fundamentalist and conservative, how would our church behave differently today? What issues might we engage with that we don't on the whole, that given our pioneers' perspective, we might be more engaged in in a more principled and extended way? And I'll leave the question there and look forward to speaking with you again tomorrow. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, the ones who are watching us online as well. Can we have another round of applause to our presenters this evening? Thank you so much for starting us out, engaging conversations, and it, it will be a pleasure for us to continue our conversations as we move along. Thank God there is a buffer here between attorneys. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Colette. We really appreciate that. And thank you so much for the conversion experience that we witnessed today as lawyers are approaching this topic, not, not as a cross-examination, but a loving celebration. <laughs> that's, that's a huge blessing. I experienced that kind of conversion. I went from theology and philosophy to law to become a lawyer, and then coming back to now a philosopher and theologian. So praise God. I've been saved. I've been saved. <laughs> so we have some uh, interesting pointers to share with you, and here's how it's going to work. We're going to have some questions uh, for them directly here so they can expand on their thoughts, and then we're going to have a Q&A session where all of you will be able to participate, including the ones who are online. You can post your question there, and we might be able to get that question and submit it. The ones who are here, there's a mic over there. Can you see that mic over there? So you're going to be able to stand up as I give you the signal, and then we can line up for some of those follow-up questions as well. Who is a Seventh-day Adventist? We have different possible ways of approaching this, a social demographic way, a theological doctr doctrinal way, a historical and cultural way, which might be the focus of how we're approaching today, at least to start us out in a conversation. And there's also an ex existen uh, existential and ex uh, experimental or exper experiential way of approaching the topic. Our church has done now three of what we call global church member surveys. The third one from 2022 and 2023 uh, is just about to be released very soon with those numbers. And what we have right now, who is a Seventh-day Adventist? We have uh, a little over 22 million members around the globe. Uh, 65 plus percent of those members are in what or live in what we consider the global south. Here in the North American division, for example, we are less than 5%, 1.2 million. 
of those who consider themselves Seventh-day Adventists. The vast majority are female. Hallelujah. That's a blessing. 60% are married. 65% have children. The average size of an Adventist household is of 4.7 individuals, while the largest group is comprised of young adults, and here the bracket might find some issues for scholars and for researchers because we put the young adults in a bracket from uh, the early 20s until the 50s. So that's <laughs> stretching it a little bit, if, uh, if you would ask me. You're right. It wasn't our choice. That's the framework, right? That's the basis. But I'm glad because I'm 44, so come on now. I'm good. I'm within that. But 50% of those are 50 plus years of age and 21% of 75, up to 75. There's a major variance by division, and the respondents from the North American division are the oldest, with about 81% being adults or older adults, over 60 years of age, and respondents from the Southern Asia, West Central Africa, and Southern African Indian Ocean divisions have the youngest respondents, with 65% identifying as young adults or younger. 43% of our members went to college, amongst which 30%, a third, almost a third, are university graduates. 41% are first-generation SDAs, and less than 12% are fifth-generation or more, like myself. 58% go to churches in cities, almost 60%. 70% go to a church... 70% go to a church with less than 100 attendees. Almost 60% didn't go to any Adventist schools. So now, let's bring the people in. We're theorizing about the notion of who is an Adventist. But starting with you, Michael. How would you describe yourself as an Adventist? What does that mean for you personally? So I, I was a convert to Adventism as a child from a neighborhood Bible study group. And so for me, uh, we came from a rather, you might say, uh, nominal, maybe even agnostic kind of background. Uh, so I was meeting some people who were Christians and who loved Jesus and uh, the leader of the Bible study group liked to play hockey, so that's always a big, you know, that's a big plus for this, this Canadian. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but seeing how they lived their lives and loved Jesus was something that made uh, and, and brought the Bible alive as, as, a, as a young person. I was nine years old, um, really um, was, a, was a key factor for me. So I think it's that commitment to converting as a young person, as a child, uh, and, and, and discovering Jesus in the Bible and finding him relevant for me in my world and making sense of the world in which I live. Jesus is coming. We see all the chaos in the world around us. So for me, it gave a framework of hope, shall we say. And so for me, that was on a very personal level. Adventism is something that gives me hope. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So for me, what does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist? Uh, I think there's three narratives that we have in our denomination of what it means to be an Adventist. There's a generational narrative, there's the, which is people who are third and fourth generation Adventists. Then, of course, there's the departure narrative, people who grow up Adventists and then leave the church, right? <laughs> and there's the conversion narrative. And like Michael, I don't know, microphones don't like me tonight. <laughs> Uh, Strong voice. Like, <laughs> like, like, much like Michael, uh, I converted to Seventh Day Adventism, and I converted to Seventh Day Adventism after very nearly becoming a Black Muslim in the Nation of Islam. The year was 1990. Uh, Louis Farrakhan begun just begun to make his run across the television show. There was no social media then. So if you went on Phil Donahue, the whole world knew who you were. Some of you are old enough in here to know what I'm talking about. 
And uh, so I, I had sort of given up pork, I had given up shellfish, because Muslims don't eat those things either, right? And uh, I, I couldn't, <laughs> there were certain things I couldn't get past. I couldn't get past what I thought were some of the uh, very bigoted, deeply bigoted ideas at the core of some of their beliefs, particularly in relation to whites. Uh, that troubled me a lot. So when I got to law school, one of my first year classmates was a Seventh-day Adventist. And I was invited to church. I went and about eight weeks later, after taking a Daniel Revelation seminar, I was baptized. And for me, Adventism has taken me on a journey because as one who has converted to Adventism, I have a unique perspective and perhaps Michael will share this at some point too, on the, just how significant the demands are that the church places on you when you get baptized. In particular, we have a bad habit of worshiping the fourth commandment. And we worship the Sabbath rather than the God of the Sabbath, in such a way that it often puts us in conflict with other commandments. For example, as a convert, I was always told that family functions and events were off limits if they were on the Sabbath. But the f so that's the fourth commandment that we exalt. But the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. So I often, my father's been gone for a long time. My mother was very much alive when I converted to Adventism. And I found myself having to estrange myself and alienate myself from my blood family. And I, as a result, I radically over-invested in the church. And then I went through a very difficult personal experience. I went through a divorce. And people for whom I would have given my right arm completely turned their backs on me. Because I was not, I, I was the only Adventist in my family and still am, the church became my family. And I had overinvested in the church to such a degree that when I went through a very difficult personal time and people who I thought were my friends turned out to only have a friendship with me based upon what they thought were shared beliefs. Boy, that really let me down. I've never had a crisis of faith. I'm not going to walk away from the church. I'm not going to proclaim atheism. I still very much am a Seventh-day Adventist. But I just understand uh, that um, the church is imperfect. And despite its imperfections, and I'm going to pass the mic in a second to Colette. <laughs> despite it, I'm so sorry. Despite its imperfections, the church has probably extended my life by about 20 years just with the health message alone. And the Sabbath alone. Learning to rest and learning to take care of myself have been blessings. So we'll talk more. Well, I am one of those multi-generational Adventists, probably four, four to five generations on both sides. Um, so when people say, when did you come to love the Lord? I go, well, how did I, how, how do you define that? It's almost like, when did you come to love your parents? It's all meshed in there together. So it's, I don't have the big, the big story that many people have. And when you grow up in the church, you... You love those stories, and you think you're not valid because you don't have it. <laughs> so we have, so we need to learn how to articulate our own journey. I went through 12 years of Adventist school, and then went to a non-Adventist college, where Dr. Golden is now, as a coincidentally. But it's it's in that space where I had to learn who I was as a Christian and as an Adventist, meeting and forming deep friendships with people of other faiths and of no faith and still finding them to be absolutely beautiful people. Um, 
and we, we still, I still love these people. So, so f trying to find where I am and actually needing to question things that I have said for so many years that I believe. And when they say, really, why? And no, nobody, nobody was antagonistic. They just were curious, and I couldn't always say because we, we when you're with all Adventist friends, you don't really ask each other why, <laughs> why you do that. So I think that was a very, a very seminal piece of, of coming to choose who I wanted to be and following the, the legacy of who I had been or choosing differently. Um, the other, of course, is coming to work for the church which has its own challenges, um, and you get off the fence very quickly of deciding who do I work for and how am I going to navigate this space. And I would say that that is probably the, the, the most, that is my North Star, is the primacy of God's will in my life. It is not the church, it is whatever God asked me to do, that is what I do. We do have conversations about that. <laughs> we have some, some extended discussions, um, but God is bigger. He's, he's big enough to handle whatever I say, and, and I am willing, and I think that's the piece that I come back to, is am I willing to do and trust him, as he says, or, or follow my logic? Uh, I also was born a saint. Uh, that's, 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 why they that's why they call me Nick. <laughs> uh, at least that's what my parents say. Um, uh, third generation Adventist, you have me beat. Gra higher saint here. Uh, my grandmother was the first Adventist Bible worker in Ireland. She was the dean of women at Newbold College. My father worked for the General Conference. Um, I grew up in a, I would describe it as like a semi-fundamentalistic Adventist home in liberal Southern California, Loma Linda area. So I grew up kind of confused about the identity of the church. Um, and it took me a decade or two and a couple of degrees. Um, and, and then maybe a, my degree in church history when I was in my 30s to understand this um, version of Adventism that I tried to briefly describe and that Michael's setting out, that it was biblically and, uh, and prophetically concerned and conservative in a sense, but engaged that prophetic language not just about the future and about heaven, but about the world around us and was willing to speak truth to power as it were, to be concerned about racial injustice and social injustice as part of the gospel, not separate from it, but as part of our prophetic proclamation. And in part, that's what's brought me here today. I was 17 years at the seminary and just became a little tired of living in the wheat fields of southwest Michigan when, you know, being a lawyer and, and interested in religious liberty and public policy issues, I'd spent nearly a decade here in the Washington, D.C. area in the, in the 1990s, and I saw, much as was described here, the Lord opening the doors to bring my concerns and ministries and insight to try to give um, an Adventist presence here in Washington that was informed by these particular historic perspectives. And I love the students I'm working with. We've got a group of students, call them the Branson Fellows, some of them in the back here, uh, and there'll be more here tomorrow, that are engaged on Capitol Hill and at our church headquarters on issues of religious liberty and public policy in hopes of kind of refreshing the Adventist identity and commitment in this area, and it's been a real pleasure and privilege to work with them in the university here. So who is a Seventh-day Adventist? We heard from you now. We heard a little demographic exp uh, um, exposition on who they are right now, and let's take a look at what they believe in. That's a very important portion of that. 80%, 85% are fully committed to Jesus. The difference there would be they don't understand what that means, the other 15%. 70% or plus read their Bibles daily and have personal devotions more than weekly. 
80% pray every day. 80% study their Sabbath school lesson weekly or more than weekly. 51% read Ellen G. White weekly. 95% believe that God is creator and 86% believe in a recent creation. 91% live in a household where another person also keeps the Sabbath. 64% of all members do. A high por proportion of church members from cultural environment that are animist, polytheistic, or spiritualist of, of a spiritualist tradition believe both that the dead are unconscious, the Adventist doctrinal position, and they also believe that the spirits of the dead are in heaven and can communicate with the living. There's a tension in there. In addition, a high proportion of those from these contexts believe that Adventists can go to witch doctors and other spiritual healers. Once again, this speaks to a disconnect between recognizing and supporting the Adventist doctrinal position and identifying how the doctrinal position affects other beliefs and practices. About 95% of the respondents agreed that salvation is only exclusively through Jesus Christ. However, the data also suggests that there is some confusion about the role of health message in salvation. About 47% agreed that keeping the health message also guarantees salvation. Only 38% disagreed. About 92% agreed with the church's position on abstinence from alcohol. 92 of uh, to tobacco and illicit drugs. And about 91% reported that they had not used alcohol in the last year, with 97% reporting no use of tobacco in that same time. The data suggests that Seventh-day Adventists have one of the lowest rates of substance use of any global religious or social group. Along the lines of C.S. Lewis's framework, and here's the question, is there something like a mere Adventism? And what would that look like today? You want us to all go in order here? Yes. I don't know. Or based on whoever has it. Go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead, well, I think that's what I was trying to argue in my paper tonight. The, the mere uh, Adventism, to come back to C.S. Lewis, um, is this uh, foundational notion of present truth rooted in a approach to scripture that took the Bible seriously. And I'll be the first to admit, I think in your comments, uh, Dr. Golden, you know, that, that, that that's imperfect. Mm -hmm. It's imperfect, yeah. but it was as best as they could imagine. Sure. And so, uh, and so that, that's, that's part of it. And that ethos, that of a pragmatic ethos of continuing to search is what would guide Adventism. I'll argue tomorrow that we've, we have lost sight of that in many ways. Um, and have had uh, shortcomings of that. But Adventism at its best is rooted in Scripture, and it's rooted on Jesus Christ. So Scripture and Christ, um, that's, that's Adventism at its, at its, at its uh, mere Christianity, uh, mere Adventism kind of sense. Now, I will also say, you know, around the world, we have uh, syncretism. We have challenges where there are competing approaches. We have Christian nationalism. Uh, we have tribalism, we have syncretism, uh, we have uh, lots of different competing aspects that have, but, but I, you know, I'm trying to argue and start out this lecture series by t going back to that earliest roots, those earliest beginnings, because um, that's what gets me excited about being an Adventist. Yeah, I, I would agree with, uh, with you, uh, Dr. Campbell, with the proviso that Whatever mere Adventism is, is imperfect. Yeah. I think when C.S. Lewis is doing mere Christianity, particularly in the first chapter of that text, one of the things that he's trying to do is he's trying to show that Christian morality is in some sense uh, discernible through rational intuition, mm -hmm. right? There's a new book out, and I'm sure you know about this book, Nick, it's called Mere Natural Law by Hadley Arts. And what Arts is trying to show is he's borrowing this concept of mere 
from C.S. Lewis. And in that text, he's trying to argue that natural law is as rationally intuitive as Christian morality. I would hate to see us get to the place where we consider Adventism to be the product of some sort of universal <laughs> rational mm -hmm. intuition. Mm -hmm. That I think would be quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. So again, with Dr. Campbell's proviso that yes, there are certain, and I hate this phraseology, identifying marks, <laughs> right? There are certain things about Adventism that we would say, okay, this is part of what makes us who we are, but that all that we claim to be as Seventh-day Adventists is, as, as Seventh-day Adventists, is ultimately um, uncertain. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it, the only thing certain is our uncertainty, mm -hmm. right, in, in a sense. And because, remember, the Millerites were certain about 1844, <laughs> right, and they had to learn some hard lessons. And so I, I think uh, as long as we understand that what we're doing is sort of, you know, we're able to stand up, but we fumbled in the dark to get up, and we could fall back down at any time. I'm, I'm with Dr. Campbell. Concur, concur with everything that's been said, so I'm going to take a little bit different tact on it just to add a little variety and go back to Micah 6 8. I, I'm not sure that the Adventists at their very inception were trying to be Adventists, mm. but we're trying to be Christians. And so when it says what is required of us of justice, which is our actions, um, and mercy, which means your actions have to come from a place from within you, not just the action themselves devoid or divorced from, from your own emotional response to people. And then humility while walking with God. So we're looking at humility in our relationship with God. Then we are all peers together because, of, because we do not compare to God. Um, <coughs> so in comparison to that, so I think that... that that is the, the place in the Bible that I think is reflected in multiple places, but is very succinct right there and would sum up where, um, where I would turn to identify myself. So I just, uh, I'm teaching a C.S. Lewis course, and we just finished reading Mere Christianity this week. Amen. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, and, and, and Dr. Golden is right, the, the, the f but it's the first half of the book that deals with natural law. Lewis does get into biblical doctrine and teaching in the Trinity, mm -hmm. and so I think he would acknowledge uh, a, a biblical faith a, as well as the importance of a natural law background. And this is very Adventist in itself, and I'm going to put this down as point number one. I've got five quick points. A commitment to God's revelation, not just the Bible. Commitment to God's revelation is broader than the Bible. It includes the Bible, but it also includes nature, mm -hmm. natural law, moral reflection. And Ellen White distinctly says this. She says we should study the Bible and moral philosophy and natural law. The teaching of the natural law should accompany the preaching of the three angels' messages, is one of her quotes. Two would be a commitment to righteousness by faith, including justification and sanctification. You have to have both. You can argue about where it begins and ends, but a, a decent Adventist has to understand both. And third, the sanctification must include some commitment to God's commandments, including the Sabbath. We argue about how to keep it and all the details, but some observance, some acknowledgement of its ongoing value and observance of, of health uh, principles. Four would be commitment to some involvement with our community and neighbors. Uh, health, perhaps, education, religious liberty, outreach, evangelism. Your area may differ, but there's going to be some connection with your community if you really are an Adventist in an authentic sense. And then finally, you can't really not mention what's in our name, which is a prophetic looking for the second coming. Perfect. So we're going to do a last round over here, and then we're going to open up the mic for questions and answers from the floor and also online, okay? 
And these one are going to be more specific and coming down to your presentations, respectively, okay? So, Michael, what are some major similarities and differences between a historical and maybe based on your work and research, and especially 1919, 1922, and those, that portion, before that turning point, what are some similarities and differences between a historical and a contemporary Adventist ethos? So that DNA, historical DNA, and our contemporary ethos. What are maybe one or two major similarities and differences? So my training is more as a, in, in terms of a, a theological approach to history as well as cultural. And uh, so one of the things as a historian, uh, we, we argue that, that history doesn't repeat itself. History is not the same. It's complex. It's different because everyone's different. And so the challenge is, um, so it only makes sense that the Adventism of today is very different than it was in the early days of our church. Now, you describe some of the makeup and composition. We, the majority of our church is a, in, the, in the global south. Uh, and that means that now we have missionaries coming from uh, places that historically we sent missionaries are coming back uh, and, and are revitalizing our church. Our church would be in, in very um, dire straits if we did not have immigration we didn't have certain kinds of th these kinds of phenomena. And so, so we see um, demographic patterns. We see changes that are happening. Um, we see how Adventisms become far more complex. That's one, another thing that historians like to talk about is complexity. So the issues that the church is facing today aren't the issues that, that our early pioneers faced, but, but their insights and hermeneutical approaches lend themselves opportunities in that liminal spaces, which is what I heard you talking about, Dr. Golden, you know, there, there's a search and there's the ideal and there's the reality and there's a liminal space in between. There's a liminal space today where we can also do the same. And so we can take those insights and we have issues that are uh, confronting us about inequality, uh, climate change going around us, um, birth rates. One of the most stark things that's in, uh, impacting religion around the world is declining birth rates. Uh, and, and so, and that, Harkens back to the home and uh, and and families and and children and transmitting faith uh, LGBTQ plus you know that these are all very real uh, matters in our world in this climate that we live on live in today and so um, I would argue that um, there's a great deal in fact everything's different uh, and, and and I don't know how we could say it's it's not Adventism itself is different uh, give you another case uh, scenario when I taught in the Philippines, uh, and most of the faculty for, were from different countries, and you could count on every student being from a different country. So we're talking about a lot of diversity. You'd have vigorous discussions about not just the theology of the Sabbath, but how do you keep the Sabbath, right? And so you could make that same question, and you could ask that, how do people observe and keep the Sabbath? And that looks very different for different people. And, and yet the Sabbath has a resonance that continues, and sometimes we make an idolatry out of the Sabbath. That's that's possible. I mean, I, I remember, and there's, so there's cultural layers and permutations that are there, but there's also and theological that we talk about. But but still, there's some basic resonance of the idea of Sabbath that still um, is is deeply embedded within our Adventism that I have found meaningful for myself. Now, I haven't always resonated with some other versions of that varieties of Sabbath keeping. And one of the most awkward moments had to be when, when one of our, our helpers, one of the, the, the uh, on the lower economic uh, chain that people had worked for you and cooked meals and clean, and I, I never thought I would ever have someone like that, but I discovered very quickly, working in a cross-cultural context, if we didn't, we would be looked upon as unwilling to support the community. So our perspective quickly changed, and then we had that person working with us. Well, we had a helper on campus who wanted to become a Seventh-day Adventist. But then the people she was working for didn't want her to become Adventist because they wanted her to cook their food for them while they were at church. Mm -hmm. And so here the Sabbath became an obstacle, right? And so, so what does it mean to be Seventh-day Adventist? It's going to look very different in different parts of the world. What's the same? Well, I hope, I hope ideally, Sabbath will be a liberating force. But yet in one particular instance, 
it, Sabbath had literally become a restricting force against the very, um, very beliefs and practices and everything else that makes Adventism what I long for in my heart. And so uh, we can go back and look. And so uh, it, the, the, those principles of similarity, I, it, Adventism at its best, we find those conti uh, continuities. But in, in many other ways, we find, and most often, we find that it's problematized, it's different, it's, it's, uh, and, and it's complex. It's complex. And so that's why we need to constantly search our roots. That's why I, I believe in the importance of history, because as we do that, it gives us insights. Uh, not only do we see the continuities and the successes, but we see the challenges along the way. And that gives us an opportunity to re-examine our own assumptions. Hopefully it gives us a sense, a healthy sense of humility, because then we realize both individually and as a church that we have maybe made some mistakes along the way, but we could be honest enough, hopefully, to embrace the best of Adventism and try to make Adventism better and openly and honestly accept our shortcomings. Oh, oh sorry. As you're the keynote speaker, let's get back to you and laser focus on at least two definitions. Progressive truth for early Adventists and progressive truth for us today. Is there a difference? And secondly, activism. Does it mean the same thing in the early, in early Adventism and today? Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, great question. And I think I would go back to I think uh, Dr. Miller mentioned this in his remarks earlier that some Adventists would like to take 1844 or 1888 or any of these other different varieties of Adventism, but, but we can't live in the past. And so I would say that we need to take those foundations and look at the world around us. Uh, for example, if we truly believe in the importance of the Sabbath and creation and these kinds of things, um, Adventists should be the foremost caring about creation care. We're looking at uh, climate change as never seen before. And Revelation talks about rising seas at the very end. And, and when Jesus comes in heaven and the earth is made new, there will be sea no more. And that r raises the question, why would, there, why would that be in scripture unless r rising sea levels, unless large bodies of water were very problematic at the very apocalyptic end of time scenario right and so it seems that bible prophecy has a lot to say the scriptures have a lot to say for us in caring for the environment around us and so yeah i would argue in terms of both our our theology but but it's not just going back and saying okay um whatever particular decade and and our tribes in adventism which we'll talk more about uh, tomorrow come from different eras. People see the ideal Adventism as a certain era. Uh, and and that's, that's highly, highly problematic. But, but we really need to take the earliest ideas and ethos and, and everything and take that not to any past generation, but take it to our generation and wrestle with our very current world in which we live if Adventism is to remain relevant for our world today. Which brings us to this question of activism, right? activism we should care deeply about race and gender we live in a world that's deeply divided over these issues now it, the the we don't have chattel slavery but we have um we have many other different forms of injustice economic injustice and and so i'll, I'll just be vulnerable for just a moment but when we had uh, the black lives matter right the uh, and i went with some of my faculty colleagues at the time and we went to go and march in local protests right in, in our community, I, some people say, why would you care? Why would you do this? You know, and in fact, some people even looking with disdain, you know, like this should not be something you should do. And I said, well, that's because our early pioneers cared about racial injustice in their world. If they cared that much, I need to not just teach Adventist history as an academic discipline, but I need to actually live it out in my life and go march with my colleagues. My, my best friend was a, a, a black professor um, at the school I was teaching, and we held hands, hand in hand, and marched down um, and, and did that. Uh, yeah. Because I believe activism is not just something that is, is an academic exercise that we study, but we have to live it. So the, the activism, the, the issues, the social issues, the form 
will change, no doubt. But but Adventism again, um, ideally, we need to care about we need to care about race and gender in our world and those inequities. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, social scientists are telling us if the the church that's going to survive in the future, the Christian church of the future, is going to be the one that that addresses all of these issues that we're talking about and and racial injustice and economic injustice and embraces women. You know, the Church of the Future will be the one that figures out. Philip Jenkins argues this in his most recent book, will embrace women in leadership in the church. And so if Adventism is going to be relevant, hopes to be relevant, our activism needs to address a very um, different world than our pioneers. But, but um, it, it is, if at its best, um, I think has a lot to say. There's a lot to be uh, gleaned from there that is incredibly relevant for us today. Dr. Golden, the Socratic tenant, knowing what you know, and maybe most importantly, knowing what you don't know, what do you believe we need to understand as Adventists that we don't know today? I think what we need to understand as Adventists that we don't know today and this, gives, this is good because it gives me an opportunity to address Dr. Miller's point uh, when he gave his response. You know, when we study the difference between the fervor of abolition in the early Adventist movement and the relative silence or seeming complicity with Jim Crow, I think Dr. Miller has a point that we can integrate into this part of what it means to be an Adventist, which is that we have to be fervent, but we have to also be strategic, right? And perhaps that's the takeaway, right? Perhaps the takeaway is we have to be ardently opposed to things that are immoral or that run counter to God's law, but that we also have to be careful and strategic about how we handle them. So I, I'm willing to accept that, right? I mean, I think that is perhaps a takeaway from that. Now, here's what we don't know today that we need to know. What we don't know today is that while it is fashionable to condemn the Dred Scott decision, and it's fashionable and almost easy to condemn chattel slavery, what is much more difficult to do is trace the legacy of chattel slavery through American history and into the 21st century. Because there is a clear line from Dred Scott to George Floyd. And we like to think that, and I'm, I'm a lawyer, I, I, like to, I, like to say, I get to talk bad about lawyers because I am one, <laughs> right? And I'm not really, I don't want to say I'm talking bad, but one of the things that we need to know is that although we can condemn Dred Scott, Congress, during the post-Reconstruction era, attempted to undo Dred Scott. The Civil Rights Acts of 1875, the Reconstruction Amendments, 13th that ended slavery, 14th that gave African Americans, newly freed slaves, citizenship, the 15th that gave them the right to vote. By the way, the right to vote was considered basically, none of those, all of those amendments were essentially nullified by the Supreme Court in a series of decisions from the slaughterhouse cases all the way up through Plessy versus Ferguson that upheld separate but equal the Supreme Court of the United States ensured the legacy of chattel slavery until deep into the 20th century. Because when President Lyndon Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964 on July 2nd, two days before Independence Day, he signs legislation that the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional in the 19th century because Congress tried to end Jim Crow with the Civil Rights Acts of 1965. The Supreme Court said the government can't tell private businesses who to serve. 
right? And, and here's something else as Adventists. So, so we need to know that it's not enough to be opposed to slavery. That's easy. I'm curious, and Dr. Campbell, I don't want to give you another research project. I'm curious as to how many Adventists participated in the American Missionary Association, an organization of Christian groups that during Reconstruction went into the South. They supported the Freedmen's Bureau. I'd be fascinated to know the role of Adventism in the public discourse around the Freedmen's Bureau, right? That, uh, to, that to me would be fascinating. So uh, the point that I, I'm trying to make here is it's much harder to oppose slavery's legacy than it is to oppose slavery. I sure wish we knew that. I really wish we knew that. Thank you. Now, um, as we move on to our audience here and their questions, Ms. Collette, in your practice, how are Adventists engaging in activism today? There, there's, there's four strategies to serve your community. We have relief, which is just stepping in when there's a crisis and, and filling a need with people. And then you take on the the rehabilitation of people. You're, you're helping them to renew their sense of self, their identity, their, their ability to live independently. And then we also look at communities at large. What is missing from a community that allows them to function in a holistic, thriving way for the, for the members of that community? And then there's the activism. The, the church does engage in all of those, of looking at the, the structural issues. I think sometimes our sense of mission gets in our way. Um, we, we talk about mission and sometimes we use it against some of those activities, that this is not our mission. Mm. So we have, mm. yes, yes, mm. It's, it's, a, it's a proclamation event and we don't recognize how holistic we need to be in how we approach a community. So we, we have a lot of food, clothes, disaster response. We have a lot of activities, but at the end of the day, the method is not as important as how you approach a community mm -hmm. and how you view yourself in relation to that community. Mm -hmm. uh, people have talked about giving a hand out, but no, we want to give a hand up. But if I'm giving a hand up, then I am above you. Mm. And we are not above people. We are peers with people and we need to walk together. And I mean, we, we have, well, yeah, like yeah. you say, we, we use that sense of mission to guide us away from some of these difficult spaces and some of these difficult conversations to be able to explore who we are and who we need to be and what do these issues look like today. But Sabbath is at the heart a countercultural hmm. um, concept for us and a means for for pushing back against what we see it is not not the duties so if i think if we embraced that aspect of ourselves and came back to that reality that we would look different than what we look like in how we reach out hmm. thank you so much because of time restrictions Dr. Miller, just one, a quick one, one, one or two minutes. Past truth versus present truth. Have we missed the boat? Have we missed the present truth DNA? Well, sometimes I think that the Sabbath needs to be rescued from Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> mm. Mm. And that um, the Sabbath we view as a one day a week where we get together with our own people and huddle together and worship. And certainly that's part of Sabbath. But if you understand the larger framework of the Sabbath in the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, the weekly Sabbath, the yearly Sabbaths, the Jubilee Sabbath, there's a whole socioeconomic system that circulates around the Sabbath of, um, of fairness, of equality. This was brought home to me. I went to teach a couple of two or three winters in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an American territory and there are American citizens that live there, 
but it is largely a first world country of commerce and um, malls uh, w in a third world country of public education and facilities. And um, we've been, our own pioneers spoke prophetically against the Spanish-American Civil uh, War, Spanish-American Civil War, the Spanish-American War, where America took over the Philippines and Puerto Rico and turned, used its imperialism to turn them into colonies. Mm -hmm. We used our prophetic voice to speak against that. We don't say anything about it today, even though a correct application of our Sabbath message, I believe, would cause us to speak against the structural inequities and unfairness, mm -hmm. and other Christians have done so. The Jubilee movement was a movement to forgive the debt of some overseas countries, including Puerto Rico, led out in by a wide consortium of Christian organizations, not any Adventists that I can find as part of it. And my question is, why is it other Christians who are understanding more the application of the Sabbath message and principles to a place that we've been for a hundred years than Adventists are. Mm. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, we're over ten minutes. <laughs> we have ten minutes graciously conceded. <laughs> to wrap up our program. We were supposed to be done by nine, right? So we're standing in grace. Do we have any questions from the audience? Depending on the length, we can take one or two for any of our presenters. Please come up forward to the mic. You can present yourself, your name, your connection with WU, and then address the question, please. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gopi Sankara. Uh, I'm a senior here at WAU. I'm a biology slash political studies slash honors major. Um, being part of the Center for Law and Public Policy and being a Branson Fellow, I found this new vested interest in religious liberties and also uh, healthcare policies. Um, something that I have is, it's a multifaceted question, but the question I have directed to Dr. Campbell is how did the establishment of the healthcare ministry within the Adventist church originate? And to what extent does it remain as vibrant in local churches today compared to its inception in early Adventist communities? Furthermore, what policies or actions can local churches take to address communities with health care disparities? Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, really, back to the 1840s, to the time of these Bible conferences, if you please, there were these questions about, uh, questions about tobacco and things like that. But that sense, a growing sense of uh, health consciousness would, would deepen and grow. And this is where Ellen White, I think, plays a significant role. I don't see her as playing a, a catalyst for theological ideas, uh, but I do see her in terms of uh, some of the social aspects of Adventism, and this would include health reform, where she will have a series of health reform visions that will challenge the church to think more consciously and counterculturally uh, about health and healthful living. And at that time, it's a different world where people tended to live uh, you know, if you were in, into your 40s, you're living a long life, and you could count on half your children never surviving to adulthood. So um, the disease was rampant, and so health reform was really about trying to develop uh, ways to just survive. I mean, our pioneers were pragmatists, and so when you have people dying around you and you think you're going to die, suddenly health reform becomes a whole lot more important. Now, interestingly, as modern medicine develops and people learn the germ theory and everything else, health re Adventist health reform will change. And it's interesting that Adventist health reformers will be on the cutting edge of, for example, immunizations. Uh, very, very interesting that, in fact, our missionaries would go and they would immunize communities in other parts of the world. And so this is the kind of thing where missions and immunizations became one and the same. Adventist missionaries would be immunized. I have numerous stories where Adventist missionaries all immunized would go over to a country, they'd meet other missionaries on the boat, they all died because they wouldn't get immunized. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, kind of comparing notes. So, and I'm not, I, I know that's kind of a, that's a pressing social issue as well right now, <laughs> but it's, it's very interesting, at least Adventism and its health message um, did uh, look, it, they, they realized if they did not treat people so that they could actually be well enough that they could hear the message, 
that, that, and so health reform became an agency of sharing so that if people embraced uh, that message, it allowed them to live better lives, to actually survive long enough that they could then hear the message that they wanted to preach to them. Good example of this is Leo Hollowell down in, in Brazil. Um, he writes numerous times in his autobiographies, um, depending which one you want to, you know, basically that it was more important that they teach the health message first, and then once they were well, then they would develop relationships with them, bring, uh, you know, sometimes the first thing that they would do, they'd find, you know, outbreaks of disease, and they'd just have immunization clinics, and they realize they're going to die if they don't immunize them, so... Um, so very pragmatic, and uh, one other thing that made me think about something, Dr. Golden, that you mentioned about the health message is that, for example, the Eight Laws of Health was taught by white racial groups that were trying to enforce a white hegemony and dominance, uh, and, and it's very interesting that our pioneers will take those ideas, uh, loose them from the racist assumptions. Uh, they would not teach them uh, the, w with the purpose of of, of the same kind of purpose, but they take those same ideas and then utilize them for Adventist purposes and uh, so that people could live better lives. I'm not saying they always did that perfectly, mm -hmm. but, uh, but certainly that was a part of the Adventist message being, and the health message being a part of, of how um, that Adventist identity would unfold. Maybe a second question? Please introduce yourself, your connection with WU, and your question, please. I'm Jordan Hernandez. I'm a theology student here. I'm a freshman. Um, and I just quickly want to present a question to uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Campbell. Um, what is one of the biggest and most dangerous myths being spread around about Adventist history within the church? And how would you approach dispelling or dispersing that myth or getting rid of it? Okay. Well, I, one of my passions is the history and the topics of race and gender, right? And so one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about this um, because our earliest pioneers were egalitarian. Mm -hmm. And so I, I it, and, and by the early 20th century, um, they were not, mm -hmm. at least not right. in the same way anymore. Mm -hmm. So by, uh, for, give me a, uh, let me give you an example of, of women, for example. 1910, there's close to a thousand women involved in, as Bible workers, as pastors, church leaders, missionaries. By 1930, there's virtually none. How do we go from a church that would fight against, uh, you know, the fugitive slave law and, and we're active abolitionists to the 1920s where you have Adventists, uh, some Adventists, not all Adventists, but some Adventists that were arguing for a black and white segregated heaven and some Adventists that were part of the Ku Klux Klan actually speaking at Klan rallies, things like that. That's probably the most shocking thing I've ever come across in my, my study of Adventist history. So these kinds of reversals, and I think we have an idealized past. We like to look back and say, well, if I were living in the 19th century, I would have been an abolitionist. <laughs> I would have been on the right side of history. And, and, so, and, and, and really how we live our lives now tells us that oftentimes that idealized sense of history is, is really not um, so simple and oftentimes people uh, who think they would be on the right side of history are not living on the right side of history in their current life. And that's the challenge that we face. And so an idealized past, and so I think that's the biggest myth that, that uh, from an Adventist historical uh, perspective. How would I disperse it? I think through education. This is one of my bright students in class. So this is why I come down to Washington Adventist University every week, because Dr. Cheryl lets me come, and Dr. Hemmings, because it's my therapy. Yeah, oh, there she, there she is. OK, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's my therapy, because you know I sit in committees and do a lot of other things. And I think like Dr. Miller, you know, when I come down here, uh, it gives me hope when I see students who love to learn, love to learn. And uh, so I think the classroom through education is our brightest centers of hope in our denomination. And so I'm proud of Washington Adventist University. Praise the Lord for this school. Amen. 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 Awesome. Are you enjoying the conversation? We're just getting started. <laughs> We're just getting started. So you can't miss it tomorrow at 10 a.m. It will be live streamed as well. Starting at 10 a.m., for the ones of you who are here at James T. Bingham Hall, you will have another presentation by Dr. Campbell, 
And we are going to have as respondents Dr. Daniel Bidiaco and Dr. Tim Golden as well. So it's just getting started. And please remember what Dr. Golden shared with us today. It's a deep truth. If you don't know who you are, someone will come up and will tell you who you are, will define you instead of yourself and your knowledge. So let's keep digging, let's keep uh, searching, and let's keep the conversation going and celebrating the varieties of the Adventist experience. I would invite now, as we close with a prayer, Pastor Pranitha Fielder. She's the administrative pastor for the Sligo Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'll invite us to stand, please, for this closing prayer. Thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing you in the morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that we are able to have safe spaces to ask questions. And we ask that you give us also the wisdom to know that if we arrive at different answers to those questions, that we can still all live together in harmony. Give us the humility to see ourselves in the wider tapestry of your work amongst all people of all faiths in all Christian groups. We ask that you give us grace, Lord, that as we express ourselves differently, as we experience you differently, as we live out our faith differently, we can all still be Adventists because there is a great spectrum to how you create us. There is a great spectrum to how we experience each other and you and our faith and give us the humility and grace to be able to coexist no matter how we experience you. We thank you for this time, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.